This is Coons Ford Turf Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turp Talk. Good evening. This is Wayne Viner along with Mason, the intern. Bill is behind the glass tonight. Bruce is away from the microphone. We have an interesting show for all you Terp fans out there. And thanks to Coons Ford for sponsoring this. As always, we're going to have Kevin Sheehan from ESPN 980 in Washington to come on and talk Maryland sports, football, basketball. Of course, we have Dennis from Coons Ford later. And in the last segment, Jeff Baxter, who played guard for Lefter Dizelle at Maryland Mason. Welcome in tonight. It's a great night. A lot of things going on. Walt Bell has now left the Maryland football program, which seemed to surprise me. It surprised me, but there's been so many rumors that Walt might leave, and he was so highly thought of. It just never happened for him at Maryland. And I... You could blame it on the quarterbacks. The the two years there, the only game that he really had it going on was that Texas game. And, boy, that was was a great day. But soon after that, Kasim Hill, Piggy, both sidelined for the year. And he was scrambling for answers. Who wouldn't be, though, after you lose both your quarterbacks? But Florida State's a big-name program, and for them to hire him seemed a little bit odd considering that over the weekend when this rumor first surfaced, We were sitting in our living room talking about how it might happen, but we really didn't think it would. Yeah, I I didn't think it was going to happen. It was happened to be up late night, last night, and I see these tweets popping up that he's going, he's going, and by the time I really looked into it, it turned into he's gone. And I I was really, uh, uh, surprise is a good word, but I'm not sure what to make of it. So you instantly start looking for the replacements. I know that they're going to start talking replacements immediately. There's Jed Fish at Michigan, Zach Azani, who was thought of to be the possible offensive coordinator because he's really good friends with DJ. He's at Tennessee, I believe. And then there's Brian Steinspring, who Maryland hired as the offensive line coach. He was the Virginia Tech offensive coordinator for quite a few years. Any of those names sound important to you or do you think it's someone we haven't even thought of i like the thought of the virginia tech former virginia tech coach just because he's already there you know you don't have to go out and get him an offensive line coach seems easier to replace than a coordinator yeah but he wasn't well thought of in his last few years at virginia tech and i think if you pick steinspring even though yeah he's on the staff Maryland's going to have a meltdown, but someone who's quite familiar with Maryland meltdowns, uh, a Terp himself, it's Kevin Sheehan from ESPN 980. Welcome in tonight, along with Wayne Viner. This is intern Mason. Hey, Wayne. How you doing, Mason? How are you? We're, we are good, and we're happy to be talking Terps. I often see you, I listen to you on the radio often, but I often see you at Xfinity Center sitting there with your good buddy Scott Van Pelt. And for you Baltimore listeners who haven't run into Kevin yet, when you watch the video board during the Maryland game and you see Scott there, usually next to him is Kevin Sheehan. How did that relationship start up with you guys? Uh, You know what? We've been really good friends for over 30 years, long before Scott even got into television. And, uh, you know, he's, I wouldn't be I, I, if he didn't have such good seats at the games. I'd sit with somebody else, to be honest with you. But um, you know, I'm kidding. He, uh, we've just been really good friends for 30 years. We, you know, we both went to Maryland. We worked together right out of school briefly, and we just became really good friends. And it's been great, you know, to see him do so well over the years. I saw a tweet from you, or maybe you were talking to Chris Cooley, used to play tight end for the Redskins, and you said something that you ran in, that Gene Steratore, who is now going to be the referee for the Super Bowl, and was the referee for that great Vikings game the other day, that you ended up having a running conversation with him at one of the basketball games? Michigan State game last year, um, I was sitting behind one of the baskets near the Michigan State bench, I'm telling you, I think he's a good ref, Sterator, but he, Izzo was working him the entire game, and at one point, he literally missed a a, a travel by one of the Michigan State guards because he was sitting there having a conversation with Izzo, and I basically, during a timeout, said to him, I said, look, nobody here is impressed with Izzo. 
We've seen Dean Smith, Mike Krzyzewski, and a lot better walk through the you know, college park be, uh, before. You better start paying attention to the game because nobody's impressed. And he just started laughing, and he said, I've been here many times. I know who's been through this building. I'll try to, I'll try to stop the conversation. But Izzo worked him throughout the game. This is the game where Mello hit the three. Um, yeah, you know, to win it, hit the hit the shot at the buzzer last year to win it. But um, he's a good dude. He's one of those guys during the game that'll come over and, and talk to to people that are sort of near the near the floor. But that was one of those I never sort of mouthed off to the referees. But Izzo's phenomenal at working the referees during the game. And it just looked like Izzo was working him too much for, for my liking. Well, I'm happy you stepped in on our side. Speaking of guys who hit a shot at the end of the game, what was your emotional swing when Herter nails that three and then, well, the wheels fell off the bus? I thought there was too much time left. Um, but, no, I, I mean, you know, here's the thing. Everybody is ripping uh, Turge for, for not putting somebody on the ball. And, I think, you know, less than five seconds to go, I think it's probably better to have somebody in the ball. Somebody like Checo would have been perfect because usually that's going to force the pass into the backcourt. Then, you know, they got to go a longer distance and they're probably putting up a 25, 30 footer, you know, at the buzzer. But you got to give them credit at the same time for running a phenomenal play to get Herder open for the go ahead three. He called that play between the first and second free throws shot by the Michigan guard on the other end because Michigan called a timeout and he's figuring if the guy makes it, he's going to need a three to tie. Um, I, you know, if you look at Mark's sort of plays out of timeouts over the years, he's really good at that. He um, is, but there's a lot but, of things that he's really good at. And for all the upset uh, fans out there, over this inbound play, I thought that was probably the best game Turgeon has coached at Maryland, if not the best, one of the best, because when you go to Michigan, who's been super hot, you have two and a half players, and you can sure make an argument that the roster isn't as good as it should be and all of that, but if you leave that out, just in that game, it was a great game, a great coached game, and we almost pulled it off. Yeah, it was so close to being such a good win. And, you know, look, I've got, uh, you know, I, I, I read the message boards. I've got so, all of my friends, you know, from, from Maryland are, we talk, we text, and everybody's upset, and they, they've been upset. And I said to, to the group the other night, I'm like, this is not the year to be upset with Turgeon. He's lost two key players. You know, I don't think Justin Jackson's a first-round pick. I don't, even, I don't even know if he'll get drafted, but on this team, they needed him. Um, they miss him as a defender and a rebounder, even if he was inconsistent as an offensive player. Bender may have been their highest IQ player, not named Cowan. Um, and, uh, you know, this isn't the year to pick on Turge. I mean, they are, they're, they're, they've got eight scholarship players that they've been dressing without Wiley the last few games. And I still actually like the team. I, I, I think they've got a run in them. They've had a brutal schedule here with the three road games that they've had. Michigan State, Ohio State, and Michigan. That's why the other night would have been such a big win and such a huge resume win had they pulled it off. But I still think they'll play well at home. Tomorrow night, choose at Indiana's winnable. Um, I think they need to get the next two to get to five and four in the Big Ten. And then somehow you've got to get a huge resume win against either Michigan State or Purdue. And really, Michigan State at home is the best opportunity. I don't think at Purdue is winnable. I, I, personally, I think Pat Painter might be the best and most underrated coach in the country. Um, I've, I've felt that way for a while. But then the schedule eases up. I mean, they could finish strong. Um, and so I don't think the year is over yet. But this is not the year to pick on Turge. They, they are not. They are down two key pieces this year. Um, and the Jackson thing was really unfortunate. People can say whatever they want to say about Jackson and the fact that, you know, he, he was inconsistent offensively. He was a man. They don't have enough men on the floor right now physically, athletically. Um, you can no. see that against Ohio State, Michigan State on the road, and he gave them at least that. 
Well, Mason, what do you think of having Anthony Cowan, or AJC, Anthony, Cow- Anthony Cowan Jr., as your number one option on offense? You know, I would love to see them have something different, but right now that's really all they're left with. You know, Carter's having trouble finding him himself open. Cowan's really the only guy that I see being able to create their own shot. And that's the problem. And that's where Justin Jackson hopefully was the guy that you could give the ball and you get out of the way. And he could make something out of it. And you saw Cowan try as hard as possible. They must be in phenomenal shape to play 40 minutes and they're still hitting threes in the last seconds to, to be able to pull that off. It's amazing with just the two real top division players that they have. On the football side, what do you make of Walt Bell packing up and moving down to Tallahassee? I'll be honest with you. I was surprised. I don't know enough about the situation and and what the relationship between him and DJ uh, Durkin was uh, or is. Um, He's a talented guy. Everybody I know in in coaching said that this guy was like, you know, one of these stars in the game and to keep an eye on him. And Mm -hmm. look, you can't blame him for what happened this year. I mean, he's he's on quarterbacks number three and four by the time we get to you know, week four and five. Um, but it could be a big loss. I don't know who they're going to replace him with. I don't know if that's actually happened yet. I, I haven't followed it here today. But I know a lot of coaches in the business think that he's a talent. It's what they said. He's a wonder kid. And you called, you're one of the few people, maybe the only person other than Johnny Holiday in the past few years to call a Maryland basketball game and a Maryland football game as a play-by-play guy other than Johnny. So you had the honor of calling the game in Texas. What kind of throw was that as a lifelong trip to actually be the play-by-play guy that day? That was awesome. It really was. I mean, I, 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 mean, I consider myself so fortunate that Johnny, I remember, had a family uh, wedding and commitment, and that was lucky. I mean, they were ready. in Texas, you know, Texas was a much better football team at the end of the year defensively, so they caught them at the right time but that was a crazy game if you think back to it and you know in the moment because of the way piggy played which was really i mean he had some big plays in that game uh, before he got hurt and then Cassim comes in and has that huge third down throw late you know they ran it for 250 plus and scored 51 points and it was a crazy game you know in the moment i was thinking Wow, I mean, you know, they may have a decent team this year. Maybe they can get to seven wins this year, you know, in, in somewhere near 500 and go to a bowl game again. But obviously, the injuries were were a massive issue at quarterback, and you, you can't you can't recover from that. Uh, you know, very few places can. You are listening to Coons Ford Terp Talk here on 1300 CBS Sports Radio this Wednesday and every Wednesday at 6 o'clock. I'm Wayne Viner along with intern Mason. On the phone is Kevin Sheehan from ESPN 980. Bruce is away from the microphone tonight. So in Texas, I was about 10 feet to your left, about ready to start looking up Rose Bowl tickets at that point because I said, <laughs> we, we finally did it. I've waited most of my life. Mason, after that game, which is a testament to what we can do when we're fully loaded. When Annie Bonham was still on the field, we sold a quarterback. You said that was a win for all Terps as opposed to beating Penn State a few years ago. Why'd you say that? Well, for the younger version of Maryland fans, we haven't seen Maryland-Penn State, which is the other game that you were referred to as one for the older fans. I think beating a generational talent team, Texas, always good throughout as long as you can remember, and as certainly as long as I can remember, just meant more to me because I've seen Texas play in the national championship. I don't really remember when Penn State was the best team in all of college football. Well, unfortunately, I do. And then they beat. How many times have they beat Maryland in a row? Twenty six times or something. Kevin? It was a lot. It was a lot, <clears throat> and it was you know there were a few years in the eighties and seventies and eighties where Maryland had legit shots to to win. And it just, they never seemed to get over the hump. Did you go to the game in 85 when Gilball? Of course Gilball? I did. It was, yeah. Of course I did. It was about 103 degrees. And at halftime, we went back to our apartment. I was living in College Park Towers at the time, right there on Hartwick Road. Not the Knox College Park Towers, it's oh. for those that know Maryland. And uh, at halftime, it was so brutally hot, we went back and watched the second half uh, from the apartment. But... <sighs> 
Yeah, that was you know that was the year Maryland was on the cover of Sport Look, Magazine as the, as the preseason number one team in the country, and I think oh, they I went think, into that game. Hold on a second. Yeah. You're one other other than myself. Other than looking in the mirror, you're probably one of the biggest Maryland fans. You left the game when we were number one in the country. I can't believe you admitted it. I, I think we had been overserved at the at the ah. time, and um, it was you know like a new start. So we we had started way too early. And it was, I do remember that day, and I remember how hot it was. And, you know, I, 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 boy, they, they, they had a chance. You know, Alvin Blount, I think, fumbled late in that game as they were going in for what would have been a go-ahead field goal. And Right, those, but they still, I, look, they still had Ramon Parides was still the kicker. It was not Dan Plocky until I think we went down to Clemson. So he's still the guy who, who missed a short kick, which put us in that <laughs> hole to begin with. So Exactly, exactly. And... I will tell you this: like I, in, in Maryland, Maryland football's always been, a, you know, a program that needed superior coaches to really compete at that level of being sort of in a top twenty-five mode in conference championships when they were in the ACC. And Bobby Ross and Ralph Region were the, the two best. You know, they 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 got more out of less than any other coach. You know, I guess Claiborne did it in the seventies, but. Ross and Friedgen just seemed to get more out of less. They didn't have top 25 recruiting classes, um, but, you know, year in and year out, they had quarterbacks, and, and that was what seemed to always get them over the hump. That is Kevin Sheehan. We thank you for being on, and you can listen to him on ESPN 980, and they have a really good online app. You can listen anywhere. Kevin, thanks so much for being on, and we will see you at Xfinity Center soon. All right, Wayne Mason, thanks so much for having me. All righty. Mason? You, you heard my take that I thought that was one of the best coach games that Turgeon has had. Do you see it the same way? I think it's ca- hard to say anything different than that. I mean, they haven't been this undermanned in his tenure here. And to stay in that game, especially after what happened the last two times on the road, was really, it was good to see. Oh, I thought it was great. I, I, am, I know I'm upset that we lost the game and I'm upset how we lost the game. But that's one play. And I've seen cases where you put a man on the ball. That man is allowed to move because it was after a made basket. And I have seen the defender foul somebody while he's chasing the ball around. So that's not a foolproof strategy. I just would have liked to have seen them do it. But, hey, if we play that way, then remember, Michigan's pretty good. And Michigan hit 9 out of 10 uh, three-pointers there for a minute. And, you know, Mark felt bad about what happened there this one hurts bad when you put so much into a game our preparation everything we did for this and to have the lead and and i didn't do a good job late obviously with 3.4 seconds to go i didn't get my message across to our players they got the ball going downhill threw right over our guys and this one hurts because uh our guys battled i look at when he said he threw right over our guys anthony cowan's job was to not let that pass get over him and he was about, I said it on our Turf Talk podcast, an inch, half an inch maybe, from tipping that ball away and from Michigan having an inbounds pass, another one from about midcourt. So I think it's kind of unfair that people are saying that they should fire Turgeon now and this is over because they were that close to winning this game. Yeah, you would have thought you'd be more upset when they lost at Ohio State, at Michigan State, by that much. If Maryland plays, in your opinion... If Maryland plays like they did a Monday night, you think they win most of their home games or have a good shot at being 500 in this conference? Yeah, I do, and I think it would have, if they played like that in our past two games, they would have been able to keep them both close. We have to remember, Ohio State and Michigan State shot out of this world, both games. Well, Michigan, once again, they came in the second half and made 9 out of 10 three-pointers. How often are you going to see this? How does this always happen to Maryland? Look, I just really, from them to have scoring around 16 points in the first half and then coming out and do that really shocked me a little bit. I thought Maryland was just going to keep it low scoring, play the game that they wanted to play coming in, and possibly get out of there with a win. All right, we'll be back on the other side of this break with Dennis from Coons Ford. You are listening to Turp Talk here this Wednesday on 1300 CBS Sports Radio. We'll be back in a moment. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. Good evening, Terp fans. Bruce is away from the microphone this evening. 
This is Wayne Viner. That's intern Mason. Bill is behind the glass. And on the phone right now, somebody knows as much about college football players and NFL draft as anybody. It's Dennis Kulatsis from Coons. Dennis, welcome in this evening. Good evening, uh, Wayne. Thanks for having me on. Mason has a long list of questions for you, but I'm going to start give him a chance to warm up here. What's your take on Maryland basketball and the pace of play that Turgeon's developed to keep the Terps in these games? Well, you know what? I think he's done a good job of, a, of adjusting on the fly. He's had certainly a lot of injuries and uh, so much for the talk that he's just a great recruiter and not a great you know, X and O's guy. I think he's proven this to be not only a great recruiter, but in fact, he's a very good X and O's guy. That's been my take on it. Well, I'm starting to see the X and O's part, and if they can keep this going with yeah. the two and a half players they have, I, I'm going to be quite <laughs> impressed. But Mason wants to talk about one of his favorite topics, college football and these quarterbacks or receivers. Mason, go ahead. Hey, Mason, how are you? I'm good, Dennis. How are you? I'm excellent. Thank you. So, looking at the draft for the Ravens, it's time to start thinking about who can they get to play receiver. For me, my top guy, if they're willing to trade up, Calvin Ridley from Alabama. Yeah, I think that's a very uh, a good observation there, Mason. He is the top receiver by far in this year's draft class. I don't think he'll be there at number 16. As you mentioned, they have to have the appetite to trade up, which they haven't done in recent years. They usually trade back, if anything. But uh, if they stand still, if, if they don't get up, go up to get Ridley, then uh, Cortland Sutton out of SMU, he should be there. There's a guy by the name of Kirk, uh, I believe he's out of, out of Oklahoma State, should be there. But they have to they have to get receiver at number sixteen, Mason. I'm hearing offensive tackle, defensive back. Not what I want to hear. They've got to get some weapons for Joe Flacco. This year's uh, draft class at wide receiver, it's not as top heavy as last year, it's not as talented, but there's you know, a lot of lot more guys in the middle rounds that can help the Ravens, but they need to get a top flight receiver, whether it's Ridley or, or Sutton there at number sixteen. And even if they have to trade up, they may, they, they should get another a compensatory draft pick, another third-round draft pick. They could pack that up very easily and move up versus drafting another defensive tackle uh, or defensive end in a third round as they're prone to do. Yes, yeah, some late-round guys that I have. Dante Pettis out of Washington, Simi Cobbs out of Indiana, and D.J. Moore out of Maryland. Yeah, D.J. Moore, I'm glad you brought him up. Uh, look, I, I think he's worth a second-round draft pick. Mel Kuyper Jr. has him rated as the best receiver in the draft. I think it's a little high for him, but... Uh, if I'm the Ravens, I would double up at receiver. I would take one in the first round. I would take one in the second round. And I would take a tight end in the third round. Uh, they've got to get some weapons for Joe Flacco and, uh, and fortify that offense uh, that's been so visible so up and down this year. And uh, their stats, I mean, I think they're a little overrated uh, from last year because they had to play catch-up in several games. So I think uh, when you're going up against a cover two zone, Joe Flacco could complete some underneath stuff, but they need some guys that have a, a large catch radius, um, like D.J. Moore and uh, Calvin Ridley. So if, if I'm asking you some Eric DaCosta, I'd definitely go after receiver. The only caveat there, Nate Mason, is if one of these top flight quarterbacks drops to 16, I don't know, but I, I, would, I would be tempted to take one because it's very difficult uh, to get one without trading up. Before we go to the quarterbacks, and Mason is loaded for bear on this one, but before we do that, I think it's interesting that Maryland had Darius Haywood Bay and Torrey Smith as two guys that went highly in the draft and, and were immensely talented, and you knew it at Maryland. And then yeah. the next set, a few years later, it's Diggs and D.J. Moore. And yeah. you've got a speed guy and a bigger guy, and I know that Mason is dying to talk about that Diggs thing, but go back to your quarterbacks there for a second. Well, Dennis, I don't really like many quarterbacks in this draft. My two personal favorites would, actually my three personal favorites would be Josh Rosen, Mason Rudolph, and Josh Allen. I don't see the Ravens getting a shot at Josh Rosen or really Josh Allen, but if Allen falls, I would definitely take him. Yeah, I would too. Allen's just such a big specimen, just a big, great big guy with a huge arm, and I'm with you. I don't think it's a neat pick. They certainly have a greater need at wide receiver, but uh, without giving away the farm, without trading away several draft picks. Uh, again, I, I'd like to see them draft a quarterback high next year uh, to sit for, behind Joe Flacco for one more year before they cut him loose the year after. But uh, I'm with you. If, if Allen's there at 16, I, I would, if I'm Ozzie Newsom and you, you know, we'd both turn in the, the draft card right away. Yeah, and 
I would not, for the Ravens, be willing to take the chance on Baker Mayfield. I just don't see him fitting into the system. Guys like Lamar Jackson and Luke Falk, maybe they'll yeah. take a chance on, but I really don't like them. Well, what about your Big 12 negative bias, that people put up numbers that look like they come out of a Madden game in the Big 12, and then they can't play in real life? Look, I yeah. got two guys for me. I like Mason Rudolph. He is from Oklahoma State in the Big 12, but he is 6'5". He's not like the other Big 12 quarterback. The other one is the Oklahoma State wide receiver, James Washington, who I don't yeah. like. They just get open too easily for me to draft a receiver out of the Big 12. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with you, Mason. I, you know, look, uh, I, I like receivers that, that can catch the ball, which, which is something the Ravens haven't drafted in several years now. But we can, we can circle back to Stefan Diggs, and I'm with you on this one. Uh, Stefan Diggs is interesting because he and Laquan Williams came out at the same time. Uh, back then, as I scouted them, uh, my sources told me that the Ravens thought that Diggs and Williams goofed off too much during the pro day. They were too immature, uh, which is really sad for, for that analysis to happen at that point in time for, and for, for Diggs not to become a Raven it was a travesty. He, they, they only saw him for three years, just like D.J. Moore. No reason in the world why they, they, they miss on these guys. They're right there in College Park, right underneath their noses. They don't have to invest much time and resources in terms of, in terms of you know, plane travel or overnight stays at hotels, et cetera, like these other uh, teams do. And how they missed on Diggs, I'll never know. If they missed on D.J. Moore, shame on them. Yeah, so I think it's, it's out now that this kid can play. And I thought that watching him play for all of these years and looking at how his body's developed, talking about D.J. Yeah. Moore, uh, Maryland wide receiver going pro after his junior year from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He could be one of those guys that plays running back part of the time and wide receiver part of the time if they needed it to happen. So he's, yeah, he is he's, multi-skilled. Yeah, he's like Golden Tate, you know, a guy that's hard to bring down after the catch. He can get the, those yaks. Uh, he's a very, very physical receiver. Uh, and again, Wayne and Mason, if he's there in the second round, uh, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be tempted to pick him even if I selected a wide receiver in the first round, whether it was Ridley uh, or, or a Sutton. I know, Dennis, I know the Ravens have learned this one the hard way, but on almost all of these receivers, Christian Kirk, DJ Moore, Simi Cobbs, any of them, they're kind of hit or miss in a way. And we've seen the Ravens miss on a few of them recently, but really there are no exceptions to that rule when it comes to wide receiver. Yeah, they can't get gun-shy, Mason, that's for sure. Just because they've been burned a couple of times doesn't mean that they can't go back to the well. They have to. We've seen other teams hit on wide receivers. Uh, it's about time the Ravens would hit on a couple. That's why, if I'm them, I would draft more than one receiver per draft. You see teams like the Steelers, like the Packers, they usually take multiple receivers every draft because they understand the game these days with the passing rules, the relaxed passing rules, uh, you know, how the officials flag uh, uh, pass on their fans frequently. Uh, they, they've got to be able to get some receivers. Look at Pittsburgh. I mean, I know they just lost to Jacksonville, but uh, they got in the hole early. But Ben Roethlisberger had a heck of a game. His receivers had a heck of a game. And that's what you need to be relevant in the NFL today. They, the Ravens have got to get away from the bull blueprint they used in 2000 and try to shut teams out. It's not going to happen anymore. It's an offensive game, and they have to evolve with the times. One more thing is, look at the guy that exploded early in that game, Eli Rogers. He didn't make many yeah. plays early in the season, but it's a guy that they took in the draft, and when they needed it, he showed up. We're talking about Pittsburgh's number 17. Yeah, yeah. Yep. yep, Eli Rogers. He did. So, the... who is the most surprising team to you at this point with only four teams left? Well, I, I, I would have to say it has to be Jacksonville. I mean, they're, the, you know, they're, you know, Blake Bortles. I mean, come on, you got to be kidding me. He's got to be the worst quarterback in a tournament. I think he does a better job when he's running the ball versus when he's throwing it downfield. But give him credit, he stepped up. He just didn't manage the game. He made some great throws when he had to. And when you look at the quarterbacks to the left, I mean, you've got you know, Brady, Bortles, you have uh, Keenum, and then you have, uh, who's the other guy? I'm, I'm drawing a blank now. Nick oh, Foles. Uh, Foles. Nick Foles. I mean, come on. Brady's uh, head and shoulders above everybody else in that class. But, look, he also has to go up against uh, three very tough defenses. So I think it's wide open. Anything can happen, as we just saw this past weekend, which was a wonderful weekend of, of football. We saw uh, three great games and one not-so-great game. But uh, for, <laughs> And I think that's what the NFL needs to get the fans back. When you, when you have compelling television and when you have uh, – the game, the, the ending to the game for the Vikings with, with Diggs, which mm -hmm. is one of the all-time greatest right. plays in NFL so, history. So, Dennis, yeah. what was your reaction to that play? 
Oh, I could, could, just like yours, could not believe it. I don't know how, I don't know why the New Orleans defensive backs were so shallow. I don't know why they went back, you know, 25, 30 Pe- yards. People I, make mistakes in the last play yeah. of the game. See Maryland basketball on Monday night. <laughs> Sometimes yes, it true. even happens to us. Oh, so hold on, Mason. One thing, after the game, because our king of the north, Jordan, is up in Fargo at North Dakota State, he called after the game, and put the phone out the window type of thing to hear all the people that was zero up there who are yelling and screaming and running in the alley because their team <laughs> finally won a game. It's a game they've lost historically. Mason, take us out of here. What do you got? All right, Dennis, one more thing. Your reaction, I'm telling you, it was nothing compared to his because he went crazy because there's our Maryland guy making a big play to win a team a game. I'm just uh, telling yeah. you, it, it did not compare. Okay, it was great. So let me take you back to Coons Ford for a moment, and then we have to head to break. You guys have 93 Ford Explorers, and I'm looking at a list here where you're just taking $6,000, $8,000 off on a new Ford Explorer and then 0.9 financing for 60 months. How do you guys do it? Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. A Ford Motor Credit, a Ford Motor Company has really been supporting us with a lot of great deals. Uh, Right now, we're Plus, with our deep discounts, I mean, uh, customers' dollar goes a long, long way. It stretches out a lot. And you get a lot of vehicles these days for not a whole lot of money. All the latest and greatest uh, features, uh, heated seats, heated steering wheel navigation, uh, you know, lane, uh, lane recognition, you name it. They, they almost drive themselves, and, and, and pretty sure they will. They probably will, but it's just amazing right. to look at a new Explorer that lists for $37,000. you are going to sell it for $30,000 to a lucky customer and almost give them the money to buy it for free. You guys are amazing. Thank Thank you you. for your support of Terp Talk. And with that, we are heading out to our second break. After the break, we'll have Jeff Baxter, who played guard for Lefty Drizel as a Terp. You are listening to Coons Ford Presents Terp Talk. This one's at every Wednesday at 6 o'clock here on 1300 CBS Sports Radio in Baltimore. Bruce is away from the microphone this evening as we enter segment three. This is Wayne Viner along with Mason, the intern. And on the phone right now is Jeff Baxter. You remember him if you're a Terp fan, played guard with Lefty Drizel on the bias teams. And he he has seen it all uh, on the Maryland side and then those great road trips you guys had. And when I saw Herter make that three, and I screamed and jumped up and down. I'm sure you had flashbacks to you beating North Carolina on a similar shot. I sure did. Uh, that was an amazing shot at that time, but at the same time, I, I had no idea that uh, that was that much time left um, for Michigan to get back down and, and possibly win the game. Well, unfortunately, your possibilities came true. I'm sure you've had some games, and I'm not sure you're on the team, uh, and I'll ask you, did you ever play against Michael Jordan? I did. I was a freshman. So yeah. you were there when Chucky Drizel drove to the basket to try and win the game and Jordan blocked it? <laughs> yes, I was. I will tell you this, though. It was a gallant effort uh, by Chuck because he had the wherewithal to, to just go to the bucket and try to get fouled, but, of course, uh, getting fouled or, or getting a call down in North Carolina, Carmichael Auditorium at that time, was slim to none. Have you ever been in a game that ended the way the game ended for Maryland where you thought you won and then you didn't? Actually, I have not. Uh, circumstances regarding just being surprised I've been in a game in that manner, and that was against Georgia Tech in the ACC tournament after we actually had, had pummeled uh, North Carolina pretty good the game prior to and on the last second play, uh, Dwayne Fer- Farrell, as we were trying to inbound the ball, uh, stole the ball and went down and scored, and, and the game ended. Yeah. I, I actually, now thinking back, I remember that game. That was one heck of a Georgia Tech team. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, they had, uh, Georgia Tech at the time had, I think, five NBA players well, let's on see. their team at the same time. Was Price on that team? Yes, he was. Dal uh, Rimple? John- yes. Farrell. John yeah. Sally. And well, for Hammond. <laughs> Hammond. Hammond. remember Hammond? Oh yeah, the yeah. Bullets drafted him eighth. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, he, he didn't Tom exactly Hammond. work out for them, but they took a shot on him. Mason, what do you? Do you I know you were talking about these runs that Maryland's given up. Let's see what Jeff thinks about that. Yeah, Jeff, three games on the road now, three times where Maryland's giving up 
a 10-plus run while they have not scored. They've given up 10 points in a row plus three games in a row now. Interesting enough, uh, this year has been a different uh, uh a game plan. If you notice, they're moving the ball much more uh, prior to these games that you're you're referencing regarding the the ten uh, zero runs. They have been moving the ball more, and, and it hadn't been stagnant as it had been the prior year, but just based on the the personnel. And they have been doing a pretty good job. All of a sudden, they've become stagnant again, and the team and they can't get a shot off, or they or they get a bad shot. I think, in my opinion, other players need to start taking. Uh, some shots as well, um, and start putting a whole bunch of pressure on on, on Anthony, on Ant Cowan to to actually have to create when the clock mm-hmm. is running down. Have you met him? Oh yes, yes, great kid, uh, a heart of a of a lion. Uh, will not back down from anyone. But he is the quiet. I've talked to him, and you almost have to ask him. Can you say that again a little louder? He is the quietest person that I've interviewed at Maryland. Yes, that that's that uh that that, that passive aggressive thing off the court. You're very quiet, but on the court, if you notice his body language and, and his ability to um, just get in the middle of the lane and, and get in an offensive player's face when you defended him, he shows how aggressive he is. He is, but the the shape you have to be in. I was talking to Kevin Sheehan from ESPN 980 earlier. The shape you have to be in to play 40 minutes and still have that energy. It amazes me. I know you guys did it, and, and Len didn't come off the court, and I know Gatlin played most of the time, but still, 40 minutes is a long time to go there without a break. It is a tough tough scenario, but I will tell you, you're, you're mentally and physically prepared for what you should be for the, the course of the season because you'll know what position you're playing and whether you're coming in and out of the game. My senior year, we were we probably went maybe seven or eight deep, and it was a rarity that that three of us even came out of the game with the exception of foul trouble. And again, that was the the, prior, the preseason conditioning that allowed us to do that. And but I will tell you, I will tell you, the coaches are coaches and the players. Another thing regarding that last question, the coaches and the players are, have done a great job preparing for the game. I just think at some point. Uh, the other team overpowers them with, with the amount of subs that they're bringing into the game. Well, one thing that worries me is other than Ant, there's nobody to give the ball to and get out of the way, and that was a big loss with uh, number 21 going out. Justin Jackson. Yeah, Justin Jackson going out that he should have been, could have been the focal point. Now, if he didn't pick his offense up by now, had he not gotten hurt, you, you don't know. It still might have been Anthony Cowan, but the, it – with you guys, you had bias. As the years they had Gravis, as the years they often had a guy to give the ball to, even if it was Kevin McClinton as the clock ran down on some of those early Gary years. Right now, it's just Cowan, and I fear to think what would happen if he twisted an ankle or something happened there. That there's just there's no depth at this point. Yeah, I concur. But I also think that that uh, Herder has the ability, believe it or not, to put the ball down on the floor. And, and do a little bit more of, of individual one-on-one play. Uh, in actuality, I mean, coming out of New York and to being the player of the year in the state of New York, you have to do more than just being able to shoot the basketball. And plus, growing up playing in those different AAU leagues that that are known for traditional uh, one-on-one plays, I think Herter actually can be that guy to, to get his shot by himself if needed. So why do you think that hasn't happened yet? You know, that's a good question. Um, it may be his reliance on that jump shot, which is just uh, amazing. I think he needs to start going to the basket just a little more, and he doesn't have to go all the way, but he can pull up in that lane, and then that will open up for that outside jump shot. Um, but I think he is, is the one out of everyone that's left on the team that's able to get that shot off and, and, and be able to take some pressure off the ant because, as you said, it, it, it will be troublesome even if they start double teaming it, that that would be a problem by itself as well. Kind of like they, um, like West Virginia did with the uh, the, the kid from Oklahoma um, a couple of uh, maybe about a week ago. They just double teamed and got the ball out of his hands. And that was Trey Young, who still looks fantastic. Yes, yes, yes. So another guy that we saw drain a three against Michigan, Joshua Tomajic, not really expected to play at the beginning of the season, but now put in a place where he has to. I think he can do more on the offensive side of the ball. Do you think they can get him more involved? 
You know, I noticed uh, I noticed him as well. He's actually fluid um, for his size, and as you said, it, I think right now it's probably the confidence that he needs to get comfortable with the fact and knowing that he will be playing uh, for the remainder of the year. And if he gets comfortable, that is a very good uh, makes a very good uh, analysis. He could be the one that could help him. He's not on anybody's scouting report, not just yet. So it's probably a good time to get him going. Are you going out to the game tomorrow night? I should be there, yes. Well, well, we are ready to have you back on the post-game show, and you can see all of Jeff's appearances on the Turp Talk post-game show if you go to the website and uh, type in Jeff Baxter. He was a frequent guest throughout last season. We look forward to having you on tomorrow night after the Terps beat the Minnesota Gophers. I'm sure there's seats available. That game is at 8.30 tomorrow night. Jeff, we'll see you then. Thanks for being on. Quite welcome. See you guys. So, Mason, I need to move this back to football for a minute because football's been my thing, but it's basketball season. Do you and others, people that we go to the game with and hang out with, like like Bucky, who follows these games, follows these point spreads, has said you cannot go to a Big Ten school like Maryland and just throw the ball all over the place, which was a Walt Bell feature, and consistently win. You need to play Big Ten football. Does that ring true to you still to this day? Yes, it does. And I'm talking about guys who want to throw it back to Jerry Claiborne's days. Run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. And then you know what we're going to do after that? We're going to run the ball. I like what Ohio State does. It's a power spread set where you get running backs like Ezekiel Elliott and you use them. And it's not all about throwing the ball. You can win games with a quarterback that's not the most talented, Mm -hmm. i.e. JT Barrett, and you still win, but it's based on we can run the ball straight at you. Well, I think Maryland can run the football. I I think you're going to see a a bit of a change in your offensive line. Some of these four-star, five-star kids who were recruited and played a little bit last year, a Marcus Minor, a Johnny Jordan at center, you're going to see them in the game, and it's going to upgrade the offensive line. Right now, my take is it's probably going to be Jed Fish is a possibility to be this offensive coordinator. He worked with Durkin at Michigan, and the other one is Zach Azani that was rumored to be the choice for the offensive coordinator before Walt got it. Both of them play big-time football. I think uh, Jed right now is at uh, UCLA. Both big-time programs. It's not going to be a shock. It's not going to be a move up. On the defensive side, bring in Coach Heater, who's supposed to be the safeties coach, but there's rumors that he is going to help Andy Boo as a defensive coordinator in waiting. And you bring in Steinspring, who did big-time college football at Virginia Tech. I like where this is going. I don't like the fact that it's changing up so much, but I like the fact that the coaches that are coming in and all the coaches are being talked about are big-time guys. You still have a lot of faith in DJ? Yes, I do, and I'll tell you why. We haven't gotten to the point where it's all his guys on the field. And I know that for some people it's hard to watch these four and eight seasons. That's hard for me to watch. But I'm going to ask you to go back to the coordinators for a second. Is it a step up to move from a passing game coordinator at a big school to the offensive coordinator of Maryland? I think so. Maryland is a big school, and you play the you play the uh, actually you play the Hall of Fame every season. Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Michigan State. So yeah, it's a move up. Uh, that, that's just my take on it. I think it's a good job to the offensive coordinator here at Maryland. And before we head out here, I just want to say one, one more time, I was really impressed by the way Maryland basketball played. I know there's a lot of disappointed people out there, and believe me, I'm disappointed enough. But I was encouraged. Tomorrow night's a big deal. you got to win tomorrow night. Minnesota's a little down. They lost a couple players. You think we got a win coming tomorrow night? Yes, I do. I think we got a win coming tomorrow night and then Monday night against Indiana, and then we'll be back right here on Wednesday. Wednesday, we'll be back. So we have the Sports Maven at 9 o'clock on Saturday here on 1300. And of course, we have Coons Ford Turp Talk. Thank you all for listening. This is Wayne Viner. Bruce is away from the microphone. For Mason and Bill behind the glass, thanks to Jeff Baxter and Kevin Sheehan for stopping in. This is Wayne Viner. Go Terps! Beat those gophers! We'll see you on Saturday.